buffet. And uh, for our next speaker and our last speaker before we break for dinner, and there's pizza waiting for us, um, stay here because uh, she's probably uh, one of the most interesting speakers that we can possibly have at this conference. Um, her blog is sexandthestate.com. She also uh, is an entrepreneur and involved in other things as well. She follows the map. She's just a really impressive individual. And um, yeah. her blog in particular uh, focuses on the interaction between the sex and the state. But uh, what is really interesting about it is that it completely shatters, completely shatters the leftist state about how the government should interact with people and their personal and private lives. So I think that's really amazing. And what she's doing, um, whether you can agree with her views or not, um, I think that uh, her viewpoint is fascinating. And I think that it's really important that, um, just like with so many of the speakers in the Diversity dialogue is based on that. It's really important that we let people know, you know, if they're like, part of a demographic such as the LGBT community or the feminist movement, or if they're sex positive, meaning that they're not judgmental about uh, personal decisions and private lives, then, you know, they're welcome in our movement. These people are a part of our movement, they always have been. So we just need to acknowledge that and, and, help, uh, and help clarify that. So that's what uh, this conference is doing today. So I'm really happy to introduce to you Kathy Reisman from SexInTheState.com. Department of Defense, you realize 36% of all military spending 
money in the world is spent by the United States. Okay, even if sequestration had happened, and Paul Ryan, I mean, um, yeah, this budget hadn't gone through, we would still outspend the next country by $300 billion a year on defense. Um, this is a complete and total disappointment, and it's not just a disappointment. I mean, I see a lot of young people here. Um, we are not going to be able to retire. These entitlement programs, which steal 15% of our income, regardless of how little we make, and then give it to Social Security recipients who are on average far wealthier than we are, you know, this is this is stealing from us, taking our future from us. It didn't even touch those entitlement those entitlement spending. So, um, you know, we have a message. The Tea Party has a message. The GOP has a message, and that is reduce spending, handle entitlements, stop overfunding our military so that we can have a future. But nobody's listening to us. People are not hearing us, especially three groups of people, and those are the three groups that I want to focus on today. Um, those three groups of people are single women, African Americans, and Hispanic people. And so I'm going to offer kind of a, a few um, policy recommendations that I think will enable us to reach out to them and um, will not require them to be our small government ideals. In fact, these policies are, are more in line with free market ideals and small government than what we currently have on offer for them. But you may not like them. You may say, this is too far, this is not good enough, and that's fine. But the point is, unless we're thinking about what we can do for people, individual people, people who don't look like us, people who have not traditionally listened to what we have to say, we're not going to get anywhere. And, and the Paul Ryan budget is going to be the way that we go forward, and they're going to keep stealing our future. So I don't want to see that happen. And so what I want to say before I, I bring forth my policy recommendations is something that the, the GOP and the Tea Party and free marketers are, I believe, going to have to do if we're ever going to succeed with these changing demographics, because I didn't just make up these demographics. Single women, as a percentage of the population, are growing. People are delaying marriage, they're not getting married, and so if we only appeal to married women, we're not, we're not going to be talking to anybody. Um, uh, Hispanic people, as a percentage of the population, both through uh, childbirth rate and through immigration, are again growing much faster than white people as a percentage of the population. African Americans as well. So, to ignore these populations as we've kind of done in the past is going to be a huge mistake for us, especially for young people who believe in free markets. So how do we build them? Well, first of all, we need to admit that we don't quite fully understand where they're coming from. So there's a phrase that I'm going to introduce to you that people on the left have used um, and people on the right have kind of dismissed or, or failed to understand. But it's, it's really actually very benign and I think very helpful. And that phrase is checking your privilege. Um, it's, it's definitely very controversial, but, but I think actually when you, when you break it down, it, it's not controversial at all. What it means is there are certain things that you cannot know on the basis of who you are. Okay? So, I mean, we can all understand that. If I am a white woman, I do not know what a black person goes through, right? I have never experienced racial oppression like that, right? As a straight person, I have never experienced anti-gay discrimination. <coughs> And so what that means for me is that I need to understand that I am limited in my understanding and ask them, hey, what is it like for you? What are your unique challenges? What do you go through on a, on a regular basis? And I believe that we failed to do that as a movement. And I, I, you know, I was talking um, to some people before about this. Recently, the GOP Twitter account uh, tweeted out a tweet about how Rosa Parks ended racism. <laughs> so, it's not over. Um, I hate to tell you, and, uh, and but I need to tell you because if you say stuff like that, the people who know that it's not over are not listening to anything else you have to say, and that's just the reality of the situation. So, I'm going to talk about some policy prescriptions now. But like I said, if you don't like them, that's great. Talk to somebody, figure out what their problems are, and then come up with a better solution. Because I. You know, I may be alone in saying this, but um, among libertarians, but I do believe a room full of conservatives is smarter than one libertarian. So let's all get on this problem and work together. So the first one I'm going to um, suggest is uh, ending the drug war and school choice, right? So those are two things. Most libertarians, are, most conservatives agree with the school choice thing. Um, it's been incredibly successful. Bobby Jindal in Louisiana, um, Governor Christie in New Jersey, have instituted some great school choice programs. They are shown to really help students. They've, they've been shown to really improve schools. Um, but we've not packaged this very well. The fact of the matter is, uh, your average black kid goes to a far worse 
most public school than your average white kid. Um, you know, there are kids that desperately need to be saved from failing public schools, and, and they're not Tea Partiers kids. They're not. And so if we can present school choice as a way to um, help ameliorate uh, intergenerational poverty, I think we're going to, first of all, actually have something to offer minority groups. And second of all, um, this is a way to shrink the size and scope of government. Second thing, ending the drug war. Again, it goes back to privilege. When I was a Republican and I was reading Ann Coulter, I, I knew drugs were bad, but I had no idea how bad they were on drugs. Is. I had no idea, as a lower middle class white person, what it was to sit in my home and fear armed SWAT team raids beating down my door, throwing my home into disarray, shooting my dog, and taking my dad away to prison for owning substance. Now, you try to succeed as a person under those circumstances, it's a lot harder. And again, as has been pointed out, for what? The plant's still there, but the dads are in prison. That makes it a lot harder to succeed. So again, we need to end the drug war. Not so lazy, you know, white stoners, you know, can get high. No, to end intergenerational poverty, to get those dads out of prison and into homes where they can raise their kids. Okay, so I want to talk about um, Hispanic people for a second. We really not had a lot to offer Hispanic people up until now, um, except go home, and if you don't, we're going to make you. So that's kind of problematic. And I understand we want legal immigration. We don't want just anybody coming in, um, you know, without any kind of information about who they are and what they're doing. Sure, I understand that. But let me talk about a policy that we, as small government pro-business people, absolutely should oppose, and that's E-Verify. I don't know if you guys know what this is, but it is creating another national database for the you know, intelligence agencies to mine and, and lock us up. Um, that every employer has to, has to add every applicant to this, this database. And, um, and every employer, even if you're just a single person who wants to hire another person, you have to become an administrator of an E-Verify account now. And this is to verify that the person uh, is, is legal to work in the United States. The problem is you are not legally allowed to run the check on the person until you decide to hire them. So you've gone through the entire process, you're definitely going to hire them, then you run them through. Well, it's, it's an expensive and time-consuming process. You're obviously going to discriminate against someone who might be foreign-born, because you don't want, at the end of it, once you've said no to all the other candidates, to then not be able to hire them, because they don't, they don't um, pass through E-Verify. And, like healthcare.gov, the last national database, um, it's going to have glitches. It's going to have problems. And already, even though you verify is used by 1% of employers and it's totally voluntary, they already have people who are legally allowed to work in the United States not be allowed to work because of glitches in the system. But more importantly, the most uh, pernicious aspect of e verify is that it's, it's going to cause discrimination against foreign born people. So we've got the Republican Party on one hand saying, this is a nation of opportunity and you need to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, but we're going to cut your thumbs off while growing the size and scope of government for a policy that's not going to do anything to prevent illegal immigration. That's E-Verify. That should not, no Republican, no free marketer should ever support anything like E-Verify. The third thing we're talking about is single women. So we have a lot of people on the right, um, I think I saw a booklet over there actually saying you know, the wage gap is not a result of uh, sex discrimination and we need to oppose any legislation um, that would try to legislate ending the wage gap. I agree, like we all agree, okay? Because women make individual choices and because trying to legislate pay is going to absolutely have unintended consequences. However, ending the conversation there and saying, okay ladies, Know, it's handled, you know, then for yourselves, it's not good enough. Single women, I'm going to tell a story. Um, I am, I live in Virginia until recently. I just moved to D.C. and uh, Virginia ran a, a gubernatorial candidate named Kim Cuccinelli. And Kim Cuccinelli lost, even though his opponent is, even by Democrat, I mean, even Democratic operatives call this guy a slime ball. He's awful. Um, but he still lost, and he lost most severely, more than any other group among single women. Ken Cuccinelli had an attorney general who passed a, or, or proposed a law which would force a woman who had a, a miscarriage to undergo a transvaginal ultrasound. Now, I don't know if you guys can 
figure it out from the name. But that's a wand inside the woman's body, and, and the hand is, is, is the government, okay? This is not small government conservatism. This is, this is, this is institutionalized misogyny. And so, Ken Cuccinelli himself uh, created an entire website defending a sodomy ban. And a sodomy ban, I don't know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, it's, it would never be abused. Nobody's been prosecuted with a sodomy ban. It's used to uh, prosecute child molesters. Well, no, these sodomy bans are used by police to harass gay people. Um, they were written for that purpose. That's what they're used for. There have been case, documented cases of it in Louisiana. So, King Cuccinelli and his, his uh, attorney general lost. And if, if that's the face of, of what the free marketers and Republican Party has to offer women, know your wage gap is no big deal or it doesn't exist, and here's a, a wand, that's not going to work going forward. So what can we offer women that's actually free market, limited government, uh, adheres to our principles? Well, did you know that every other country, um, all, the, all the European countries have birth control over the counter, that there's absolutely zero medical reason to force women to go to the doctor to get a prescription for birth control? If we're a pro-life movement, you know, if we, if we are, shouldn't we be focused on preventing pregnancies? Why in the world is this a thing? It's, it's a big government problem. It's a, it's a legislative problem. Let's get the government out of the way and give women access to birth control. Okay. Um, so those are, my, those are my three main policy recommendations. Like I said, you don't like them. Don't better stuff. But the idea that we're going to appeal to these demographics with the things that we've been with the Rosa Parks tweet and the transvaginal ultrasounds and, uh, and the, you know, import them all now, that's not going to work going forward. And so, um, I just I want this to be the beginning of a conversation that the Tea Party and the GOP has um, because it's really important. Economic freedom is so powerful. It's too powerful to let outdated views and a bigoted um, view of ourselves get in the way of making sure everyone truly does have the opportunity to earn a living, contribute to economic growth, and retire. So, um, like I said, uh, I, I blog at sexinthestate.com. Check me out. I'm on Twitter at Kathy Risenwitz. I'm on Facebook at Kathy Risenwitz. Um, and I really appreciate you guys coming, listening to me. I'd love to hear if you uh, agree with me, disagree with me, whatever it is. Thank you.